This is a production of Cornell University. I'm going to begin today with a, a brief discussion of what hurricanes are, so we're all on the same page. Uh, talk about basic hurricane theory, but don't worry if you're not theoretically inclined. This will be a fast uh, session. Um, and then talk about the real subject of the talk, which is how hurricanes vary with climate. There are all kinds of reasons we'd like to know about that. What have hurricanes been like in the distant past, for example, during ice ages? and how might they be affected by global warming. This is a very interesting subject that we've learned something about, but we have a long ways to go. So let's begin with a, just a quick overview of storms. Now, here I'm introducing a term that might be new to you, tropical cyclones. This is the generic name for this phenomenon, no matter where it occurs in the world. And I'll show you a map in a minute of where they occur. Um, and yet, in this part of the world, we tend to refer to them as hurricanes. So what is a hurricane? Um, if you look at a meteorological glossary, you'll see that it is defined as a tropical cyclone with winds in excess of about 74 miles per hour occurring over the North Atlantic or Eastern North Pacific. So it's a strictly regional term for a generic phenomenon that we call tropical cyclones. And I always think it's interesting to figure out where the term came from. And um, it turns out that the pre-Columbian inhabitants of the Caribbean all had words similar to that to denote their god of evil, uh, Urakan um, from the Mayan, or the Taino and Caribs, who were different tribes around that region, uh, called, called him Hunrakan, and he was their god of evil. And uh, there is an image lifted from an ancient Cuban vase of Unrakan. Uh, which I think is fascinating. You see this sort of spooky looking mask and where there should be ears, there are these arms twisted into a spiral. Not only is it twisted into a spiral, but it's the correct sense of rotation for a northern hemispheric hurricane, suggesting that these people understood that hurricanes were rotating storms. Believe it or not, Western science did not reach that conclusion until the middle of the 19th century. And yet there is this hint that these ancient tribes understood that many hundreds of years before that. It looks a little bit like the symbol that modern meteorologists put on weather maps that you see on the right there to denote the presence of a tropical cyclone. And those people who invented that symbol did not know about Unrakan. Anyway, that word uh, was first heard by Columbus himself and brought back who experienced one, experienced a hurricane on his fourth voyage which is a very interesting story of itself, brought that word back to the old world and it went through various permutations to arrive at what we call a hurricane today. Now you've probably all seen these really nice satellite pictures of hurricanes. Uh, we've been looking down from space since the late 60s and since about 1970 we've been able to catalog virtually every storm on the planet. Before that we missed quite a few. It didn't happen to hit a ship or land. When you look down from space, you see this swirling mass of clouds. It's a few hundred miles across. And you're looking at the top of the storm, which is about 10 miles or 11 miles above the sea surface, where the temperatures are well below minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're looking strictly at ice clouds at these altitudes. So it's a kind of an irony that um, the tops of hurricanes uh, are in a part of the atmosphere which is some of the coldest air you can find anywhere in the planet, including Antarctica, the upper tropical troposphere. This is zooming in. This is a nice picture uh, from a space station showing the eye of another hurricane. And uh, not all hurricanes have eyes, but when they get strong enough, they usually do. And you see this sort of circular mass of, cl of uh, clearing here, surrounded by this annular mass of clouds which we call the eye wall. And the reason is that the inner face of it really is like a circular wall. And in fact, we've been flying research aircraft like these two into hurricanes um, since the mid 1940s and taking measurements. And uh, here is a, a photograph from one of those missions of the inside of a hurricane. 
which, and the photograph just doesn't do it justice. You know, sometimes you, there are things you can't take a picture of. It's like standing in a coliseum that's 11 miles high and maybe uh, 50 miles across, and it's white, and there's a, often a cascade of ice crystals falling down the inner side of the eye wall. That blue sky at the top is the stratosphere you're looking at. And there are low clouds just a few hundred feet above the water that you see at the base of the eye. It's a really magnificent thing. <clears throat> and I um, fantasize that when I retire, I'm going to start a hurricane safari operation to take paying customers in to see this. It's such a magnificent sight. And uh, if you think it's a rough experience, uh, it isn't really. I've had much rougher experiences, I'm not kidding, on United Airlines than I've ever had in this experience. And I wasn't even dragged off an airplane, so. Um, let's just look at some of the climatology of these storms. Uh, you see this pretty well. Uh, this is just a map of the tracks of tropical cyclones all around the world from 1945 to 2006. So there's this familiar area in the Atlantic, these storms begin anywhere from off the coast of Africa all the way westward to the Gulf of Mexico. They move toward the west and north and then often recurve off to the east and can even affect uh, Europe occasionally as non-tropical storms. Uh, there is a band in the eastern Pacific you don't hear as much about. These storms form off Mexico, move westward, almost never affect land. Once in a while, one will recurve into Mexico or affect Hawaii, but that's unusual. And then a very active region in the western North Pacific, in this region here, extending across the Bay of Bengal, the Eastern Arabian Sea, and another belt in the southern hemisphere going from the Central Pacific all the way across to Africa. And you'll notice that there are no storms within a few degrees latitude of the equator. And that's because there is, if you take the Earth's rotation axis and project it onto what you call up at the equator, you get nothing and you need to have that rotation uh, to get a hurricane going. So no hurricanes on the equator, which is very useful knowledge for you if you ever think about retiring and sailing a boat around the world. If you're afraid of these storms, you stick to the equator and you'll be fine. Uh, you may have other problems, but that you won't have, okay. Um, they are creatures of the summer and early fall. This is a chart showing the number of storms in the northern hemisphere, read right off this scale at the top here. January to, to uh, December, and in the southern hemisphere, read off the bottom scale, July to June. Which is, and so you can see in both cases, these storms peak in the summer and early fall. There are hardly any tropical cyclones in midwinter. Okay, basic theory. This is really for the engineers and scientists, but don't worry. If you're not, it will only last a few minutes, and then the pain will be over. And uh, a, a tropical cyclone is a particular kind of heat engine. It's an engine for turning one kind of energy, heat, into another kind of energy, in this case, wind. And this is a cartoon of such a system. In the center of the storm is the left axis here, and this is up to 16 kilometers, which is about 10 miles, and out to about 200 kilometers. And this is the eye at the center of the storm. This is a cartoon of the eye wall cloud. And if you were to go for a ride on a hot air balloon starting at A, and I would not advise you try this, but if you can do it in your imagination, you would find yourself spiraling in toward the center of the storm. And when you reach the eye wall, you go shooting up and out, and over a very long period of time, weeks and weeks, you might come back down, uh, if you were still alive, to A here, okay? Now the lurid colors on this are a measure of the energy content of the air for the scientists engineers, this is the entropy of a mixture of, of uh, dry air, water vapor, and condensed water all assumed to be in thermodynamic equilibrium with each other, so it's a conserved variable. It doesn't change except by uh, radiation and by fluxes from the surface. And you'll notice that as you go from A to B, you go from cold colors to warm colors, the entropy is increasing. And that reflects the firebox of this heat engine, which is a transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere, made possible by the fact that the tropical ocean is not in equilibrium with the tropical atmosphere. And that is thanks to the greenhouse effect, by the way. Then when you go shooting up, you're along a line of constant entropy. That's, that's called an adiabatic process. And eventually you come back down another adiabat. And this turns out to be the four legs 
of the uh, theoretically most efficient engine for converting heat into some other form of energy. It's called a Carnot engine. Uh, it's the most efficient engine you can have operating between two fixed temperatures. And the engine consists of adiabatic, uh, rather isothermal expansion, which is what you have on this leg, adiabatic expansion, isothermal compression, and adiabatic compression. So it's almost spooky. If you read a thermodynamics textbook, they can't seem to come up with a real Carnot engine because they don't know hurricanes. If they knew about hurricanes, these thermodynamic texts would use this as an illustration because they're almost perfect. Except for one thing, most engines are hooked up to something to do something useful, right? This engine doesn't do anything useful. It doesn't do any work on its environment, to a first approximation. Instead, all that wind energy is, is eaten up uselessly and dissipated back into heat, back in this end of the engine, in the warm side of the engine. And that actually makes the engine run faster than it would otherwise. It's still not doing any work, so it doesn't violate any. And um, this is the only equation I'm going to show you, so uh, patience. You can use that Carnot cycle to develop an equation for the maximum wind speed, called the potential wind speed, V potential. The square of it is equal to this stuff. And what is it? You have the ratio of exchange coefficients for heat and momentum, the surface temperature, the temperature at the top of the storm, which we call the outflow temperature. And this last term is what's driving it, is the disequilibrium between the ocean and the atmosphere. So if you're interested in heat engines and things, you found the perfect one here. This is a map of this theoretical potential intensity calculated in the current climate. This is the maximum over a year uh, that you would find. It's in meters per second. If you want miles per hour, you basically double that, a little bit more than double it. And you can see that you get very high wind speeds in the tropics. The heat engine doesn't know that it can't work on the equator. But, um, and places like the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, all the places we observe hurricanes. Um, all right, so we're going to use that, partially this idea, to explore uh, how hurricanes will change in the future and to understand how they've changed in the past. What can we learn from past hurricanes? Well, we have the historical record. But it's actually really poor and really short. So we are turning now to a new uh, field called paleotempestology, the study of ancient uh, tempests or storms in the geological record. And um, this didn't quite come through, but let's look at the bottom chart here. Now it seems to be slowly coming on, but here's the bottom. Look at the bottom chart. This is sort of a vertical cross section through a typical beach that you might find in the Atlantic seaboard. You have the ocean on the left. You have a sandy beach called a barrier beach. And behind that, if you've ever been to the beach, you may have noticed that there's usually a marsh or sometimes a lagoon. And in that marsh and lagoon, plants are growing and dying and settling to the bottom and uh, decaying and forming a kind of mud. But when you have a hurricane, one of the most severe manifestations of it is a storm surge. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But that tends to be a big wave, if you will, that washes sand back into these marshes and lagoons. So if you take a rubber raft and fill it with graduate students, as some of my colleagues have done, and a cheap coring device, and go out in the lagoon, and you drill down and you take a core, you're going to see a layer of mud with these interspersed sand layers. Well, you can radiocarbon date the mud and figure out when those sand layers are put down. So that's one technique in the field of paleotempestology. And here is a record. And um, it goes back uh, 5,500 years. So I want you to look at the top part of this chart. And at the very top is the age in years, going back to 6,000 years. And this is from, an ice, uh, from a uh, core taken in a lagoon in Vieques, which is an island off of Puerto Rico. And what you're seeing is a measure of the size of the grains that constitute the material in the core. And every time you see an upward spike, that's a sand layer, basically. And that denotes a hurricane. And you'll notice that um, there have been a lot of hurricanes recently. Um, there was a period uh, back about 800 to 1,000 years ago with very few. Then there were lots between about 1,000 and 2,500 years ago. Not very many here. Wherever you see those gray 
slices, there weren't very many hurricanes. For a period of a thousand years, or hundreds of years, this middle chart is a completely different paleo proxy for El Nino. And if you look at that, where there are lots of El Nino events, like in this period here, there aren't very many hurricanes, which is reassuring because we know today that El Nino suppress Atlantic hurricanes. And that seems to be true in the past. So we're learning an awful lot about the past variability of hurricanes way back before historical records are maybe 150 years long, but it's only in the last 50 years we really consider the record to be robust. Uh, whereas this technique, at least at particular places, you can go back a long time. Here's another record from a, um, a sinkhole in the Florida panhandle um, showing a record of hurricanes. Uh, this is now in conventional years AD and BC, so going back about 4,000 years. And you can see that in this particular place, there used to be a lot more hurricanes than there are recently. So why? And that's what we'd like to know. If we do look at the historical record, we do see some interesting patterns. So what you see in blue here is, the, uh, is a measure of the total power uh, exerted by hurricanes uh, all the way in the Atlantic Ocean, all the way back to about 1870. Now, I neglected to say when I told you the climatology that only about 11% of the world's tropical cyclones are in the Atlantic and the other 89% are in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. But Atlantic hurricanes get 99% of the press. So be careful. Atlantic hurricanes are pretty unusual on the global standard, all right? But we have the very best historical records by far in the Atlantic. So even I sometimes focus on that. So let's look at this. The blue is hurricane power going back to 1870 or so. The red, um, I'm sorry, I've got this wrong. The red is the hurricane power. The blue is basically the temperature of the tropical Atlantic during hurricane season. And you can see they're pretty well correlated. You see this um, rapid up and down on a pretty regular basis. It turns out to be about 11 year period. Anybody want to volunteer what's special about 11 years? Yes. Cycle? Yes. When I looked at this record, Slam dunk at sunspots, right? And I put a clever student, he came back a week later, said, no, it's not coherent with the solar cycle, sorry. And it isn't, I checked his data. Nice try, right? I said the same thing you said. We don't know why there's an 11 year cycle in that. And it turns out not to be the sun, as attractive as an idea as that might be. And then there's this longer period swing, which I'll have more to say about this down and up, down and up which led some people to think there's a 100-year time scale or 50-year time scale oscillation. Now, you'll notice how well they're correlated, except in this period here, from 1939 to 1945. Does anybody think there's something special about that range of years among the students? Anybody? 1939 to 1945? World War II? Yeah. So what we think is going on there is that Back in that period, the reason we knew there were hurricanes out there is they were encountered by ships, and we didn't have satellites. Um, during World War II, uh, as an anti-submarine strategy, ships traveled in convoys. And if you think about it, a convoy may be a really great way to avoid a submarine, but it's a very bad way of sampling the North Atlantic. And so we think the hurricanes were undersampled back then. But that's just a hypothesis that's never really been shown to be the case. So why this, um, why this uh, lull in the 70s and 80s? Well, I'm going to show you something here which you might think has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's the annual um, emissions of sulfates from European industrial activity. Talk about changing gears. From 1850 to more or less the present. And you can see what happened that as the Industrial Revolution ramped up, uh, these, sulf these kind of air pollution increased. Um, there was sort of an interruption from world wars, and then after the Second World War, it really shot up. And then it leveled off in the 70s and 80s, and then rocketing back down again. Does anybody want to know why it rocketed? Anybody want to volunteer why it rocketed back down after the 70s and 80s? Clean Air Act. Clean Air Act, exactly, yeah. 
So in North America and in Europe, there are various uh, legislation to control these emissions, which are bad for a lot of reasons, and so they were curtailed. Now, when you put sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere, why am I focusing on Europe? In the summer, the low-level airflow over Europe often takes these sulfates southward over the Mediterranean, over the Sahara Desert, and then westward over the tropical Atlantic. And we think that, and what they do, is especially when they combine with mineral dust from Africa, they reflect sunlight and they cool the ocean. And when you cool the ocean, the thermodynamic cycle tells you to expect fewer or weaker hurricanes. And so it started to ramp up in the, especially in the 50s, reached a peak in the 70s and 80s and went back down. That's precisely when hurricanes started to go down, reached a minimum in the 70s, and went back up. Now, it's not just that evidence. There's more that I don't have time to explain. We really think that the hurricane drought of the 70s and 80s is man-made and um, was mostly due to sulfate aerosols. That has nothing to do with the shorter-term wiggles, we don't think, but the longer-term thing. Um, and it was during the 70s and 80s that we fantastically built up the U.S. coastline with condos and shops and things. And um, then when the hurricanes came roaring back, we were in big trouble. Uh, so there's a lesson to be learned there. This is our attempt to decompose. Now, this is just going from the 50s to more or less the present. This um, hurricane record in blue, the hurricane power record, into various things. Um, and uh, the two uh, guilty parties are the sulfate aerosols, the contribution of those are in red, and the greenhouse gas, CO2, is making a small contribution, we think, to that rise as well. The green is the sum of the two. All right, what about global warming per se? How does that affect hurricanes? Well, let's just talk about global warming by itself. Um, arguably, the first scientist who began to worry about that was this dour-looking Swede, Svante Arrhenius. He was a chemist, very good one, won a Nobel Prize. But like many 19th century scientists, he dabbled productively in a lot of other areas. And he was very interested in climate. And one of his colleagues uh, made lots of measurements of moonlight on occasions when the sky was clear and the moon was full. I love that kind of 19th century romantic science, moonlight. And because you know uh, how much infrared radiation the moon is emitting, and measuring its surface tells you how much is absorbed in the atmosphere. And he worked out uh, the absorption uh, bands for water vapor and carbon dioxide and started to worry that we were putting carbon dioxide. He had no evidence that we were, that carbon dioxide concentration was increasing at that time, but he worried about it. And he did some calculations that said if you doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, you'd raise the Earth's surface temperature by about four degrees centigrade. And, um, that's well within the modern range of estimates of about 1.5 to 4.5 degrees centigrade per doubling. And he did that without computers, without giant models, but with pencil and paper, all right? Just to let you know, this is nothing new about this problem people were worrying about. Now, of course, he took, thought it would take thousands of years to double CO2 because he couldn't predict how rapidly the Industrial Revolution would accelerate. So how well did he do in his prediction? Well, here is the record of carbon dioxide concentration. It's actually the natural logarithm of that, for those of you who know what that is, because the radiative forcing is more nearly proportional to that than to the concentration itself. Going back to 1880, to Arrhenius' time, and up to the present, and here is what the temperature of the Earth's surface did in that time. I mean, there are all kinds of wiggles and things and other influences like volcanoes, changing sun. But by and large, I would say that Arrhenius' prediction has been pretty well verified. And that is one, but only one piece of evidence that has all of my colleagues, without exception, concerned that we're running a real gamble, okay? We are running a big gamble. We're running a huge experiment on the planet. And uh, we may get lucky, but we are taking a real gamble. It's a risk and... There are a lot of reasons to be worried. I'm only going to talk about one of those, and it's not the most important one, which is hurricanes. So the first thing we can do is ask how this theoretical wind speed or upper limit on wind speed might change, because we can easily calculate that from 
climate models and from climate data. And this shows a map of how that has changed over the period 1980 to 2010 using climate data. This is not models, this is climate, although there is a bit of a model that's used to interpolate the data here. Where you see red, it's going up. Where you see blue, it's going down. And you'll notice that it's going up in the deepest parts of the tropical Atlantic Caribbean, but not off the US seaboard. And in the Pacific, it's most rapidly increasing, not in the tropics, but in the subtropics, like south of Japan and north of, uh, around northern Australia to the east in this analysis. Now, we can also calculate the expected trend from global climate models. And this is a projected trend over the next 100 years, approximately, from one climate model under a fairly um, liberal estimate of emissions. And it's the same kind of chart, and you can see similar patterns. They're not identical. A lot of going up in the tropics, in the Pacific, particularly, you see, again, it's the subtropics that have the largest increases, and there's a good reason for that, and not the deep tropics. So theoretically, the speed limit on hurricanes is going to go up. We been worried about that since the paper was published in 1987. This isn't particularly new. That doesn't tell you, on the other hand, whether real hurricane intensity will go up, because most hurricanes don't come up to this limit. Some of them do. Haiyan did. Um, Patricia in the Eastern Pacific did uh, a couple of years ago. But, um, so this is limited, but not completely useless information. What do we actually see? Well, here's something that's interesting that my colleague Jim Cawson did a few years ago. He looked at the latitude at which hurricanes and tropical cyclones reach their peak intensity in the Pacific uh, and the Atlantic, uh, both hemispheres. And I'm sorry that the time scale got dropped from this, but it's approximately 30 years. And here's the northern hemisphere. This latitude at which hurricanes reach their peak has been steadily increasing according to two different satellite data sets. In the southern hemisphere, the latitude has been, again, going down, which means toward the pole, just like in the northern hemisphere. And so we see a real signal that hurricanes, in fact, are moving out of the tropics into the subtropics, which may be a response to the fact that the speed limit is increasing faster just outside the tropics. Well, what about the future? How do we make projections of hurricane risks? Well, first of all, what are the risks of hurricanes? Why should we worry about them? Well, the one everybody thinks of is wind, OK? And um, when you think of a hurricane, you think of wind blowing hard. And uh, the weather channel will send out some poor character, like this guy you see here, to stand in front of a camera where the wind is blowing. Um, Fine, it's all very dramatic, it makes good television, but it isn't the big deal for risk. The big deal is not wind, it's water. And there are two sources of water. Rain, rain's boring. The Weather Channel doesn't send its, its people out into rainstorms, usually. Okay, uh, who wants to look at rain? But rain causes floods. So in 1998, the second worst hurricane disaster in the whole Western Hemisphere through 300 years of history, uh, it was Hurricane Mitch, uh, which affected Central America and killed 18,000 people, all from freshwater flooding, none from wind. The second source of water is a storm surge. And now, you've all heard that term, I'm sure. Very few people can visualize what a storm surge is like. Uh, and they don't even really know what it means. People like to think of it as a big way. It is exactly same thing as a tsunami. Hydrodynamically, it is the same phenomenon. It just got excited by wind rather than by shaking the seafloor. It's a tsunami. And now, most people have seen these gruesome uh, videos of the tsunamis in Japan <coughs> in the Indian Ocean. But I'm going to show you a video now of a storm surge taken during the horrendous Pacific typhoon uh, Haiyan as it was affecting the Philippines. So. I want you to watch this, and uh, this is what a storm surge. This is occurring in the middle of a typhoon. Oops, I'll go back and try to do that again. I may need some help going backwards, folks, with this pointer. Ah, there's the keyboard. All right, that's what I, yeah, 
You cannot survive that. You just can't. You cannot survive it. And the person who filmed this is very lucky to live in the house of the If any of you are tempted to go and watch a hurricane make landfall somewhere, I want you to remember this film, all right? It's not the wind that's going to get you, it's that. You don't want to be there when that happens. And I'd like everybody with a condo on the Atlantic seaboard and elsewhere in the world to see films like this so they actually know what they're dealing with. All right? It's not the water slowly rising and you have to get up on your roof. That's more characteristic of freshwater floods. Just some numbers. Hurricanes kill about 10,000 people a year globally and do $700 billion US 2015 dollars in damages. Uh, since about 1971 when the statistics started to be compiled. So they're pretty important among those. And if we look at the United States, um, this is just a uh, chart showing the cause of mortality in hurricanes. And the two big numbers at the top are salt water and fresh water. That uh, smaller bar in the middle is wind. And then there are other things like tornadoes that accompany hurricanes and other stuff that happens. It's very interesting, in the United States, all water damage is publicly insured through the federal flood insurance program. And so therefore, companies don't make money off of insuring for that. Um, wind uh, is privately insured. And so there's been huge efforts to quantify the risk from wind by insurance companies who make money off of this. And so there's this gap. We know far less about the water risk than the wind risk because of this. And yet the water risk is by far the most serious one in terms of human life. All right, so that's a background. Now how do we actually assess risks going forward? Well, we don't have paleo -tempest, uh, tempestology or historical records going forward. And we can't really use climate models directly for this for a simple technical reason. A climate model doesn't have enough resolution in space to simulate a hurricane properly, it just doesn't. So the eye wall of a hurricane, which is where all the interesting physics happen, is a few miles across. And the points, the computational points in the climate model are more like 100 miles apart. It's just, they miss it by a long shot. Now they do generate weak disturbances, but they don't generate destructive hurricanes. So what we do at MIT, is to take the output from these global climate models and embed within them very detailed, very small scale uh, hurricane models that are coupled to oceans. A great deal of work has gone into this. But with the large scale conditions supplied by the climate models, and we can simulate thousands and even tens of thousands of storms this way. So here is a bunch of simulated, numerically simulated hurricanes in the current climate driven not by a climate model, but by something called a reanalysis data set. It's basically a present climate data set. And the colors indicate the strength of the hurricanes. So you see some forming off of Africa, just like in reality, curving to the north, some in the Eastern Pacific, even one in the South Atlantic. You may have noticed that if you look carefully at the, my chart of hurricane tracks, there was, in fact, one uh, on record in the South Atlantic. And then this belt in the Pacific. We can do tailored work, like we produce a set of a few thousand tracks that uh, affected New Orleans for a study we did of the city of New Orleans. And so these are tracks that only, we only did the tracks that affected New Orleans. And out of that, we can do things like wind risk assessment. So here is a chart showing, as a function of wind speed, the expected return period. The return period is just the inverse of the uh, annual probability of events. So 100 years means that on average, each year you have a 1% or 1 in 100 probability of having a wind speed of, in this case, 130 knots in New Orleans. Um, the blue dots are from this technique that I just described. The green dots are from actual hurricane data near New Orleans and Katrina was about 100 knots when it went into that part of the coastline. And so we would have said that's an event that occurred every roughly 20 years. So Cortina was not such a rare event in terms of wind speed in New Orleans. Uh, but when you simulate tens of thousands of events, you see things that you've never seen in history because you're basically doing 
10,000 years of history uh, rather than 100 years of history. So once in a while, we see a hurricane in the, in the Persian Gulf. Now, we've never seen one in history, but physics says it's possible, but rare. It's probably about a one in 200 year event. So this storm formed in the central Persian Gulf and traveled uh, to the east. There's Dubai and the contours are the level of storm surge at its peak experienced anywhere in the Persian Gulf with this storm, okay? Um, how did we generate this? So once we have these hurricane tracks, we can couple them to a computational model of storm surges, and those are quite good, those models, and predict what the storm surge will be like. So we would expect that this storm would generate a three, uh, maybe three and a half meter surge at Dubai. That's about 10 feet. Now believe me, if you've seen photographs of Dubai or if you've been there, okay, the people who designed that city had no idea that it was possible to have a hurricane. If something like that happened in Dubai, it would be a terrible calamity for that city, all right? So there's a point, see there's an overarching point I'm trying to make. Insurance companies and others have looked at risk strictly through the lens of uh, historical statistics. What have storms been like, earthquakes, whatever, in the past? That is one way of knowing the world. It isn't the only way. You could also use the fact that we understand physics to estimate risk. And I'm saying that to you because I sincerely believe there's a big future in that for students. A future which is being impeded by academic stovepiping. Okay? If you go, if you're an atmospheric scientist and you go to your advisor, and I'm not criticizing anyone here, this is a universal statement, say, I want to study risk from a scientific point of view, they say, well, that's not science. And they're partly right. If you go to an engineering department, they'll tell you that's for statisticians. There's no place for it to go, but man, is there a big opportunity. And that's true almost universally in universities. A lot of the big opportunities are at the boundaries of what used to be considered separate disciplines. And I truly believe that because I've experienced it. This is one of those. Bringing physics and science to bear on risk, it's way too important to leave to the statisticians, and I mean no insult to statisticians. It's just we have to go beyond that. Now, I'm interested in the general question of hurricanes and climate. So you might ask the question, what were hurricanes like in the Eocene 55 million years ago? Maybe you don't care. I do, because I want to know why I'm not just out there for making predictions. I'm driven by curiosity. What were they like? Well, we have simulated. This is when there were crocodiles wandering around Greenland, places like that. It was very warm. You know, the average surface temperature at the North Pole was about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, it's a very different climate. So here is one of a set of many storms of a hurricane that started in the Arctic Ocean and made landfall in the Yukon here, okay, um, during the Eocene period. Now the land, in this case, was not quite in the same position 55 million years ago as it is today, but I couldn't find an Eocene map. So it's on a modern map, but it wasn't too different. Um, all right, so we're learning about what hurricane activity might have been like in the distant geological past, and I happen to think that's fascinating. Well, we can use that technique to downscale uh, or to simulate hurricanes in uh, future climates to the extent we believe global climate models are simulating. And the problem with the future is it's hard to predict. And so we downscaled uh, seven such models. And what you see here is a prediction of global hurricane power, actually a, a now cast going from 1980 to about the present, and then a future prediction in red going to the end of the century uh, using a business as usual carbon emission scenario in which we just keep pumping more and more carbon in the atmosphere. The red line is the median amongst those seven models and the shading is a standard deviation up and down from amongst those seven models. So there's a lot of uncertainty as there is in all climate predictions. Uh, uncertainty is not the same thing as ignorance, all right? It's just a full confession of what we know and what we don't know. And you can see that hurricane power dissipation goes up by 50% or so uh, if in the median among these models. So we have to look at it as a problem of risk. Maybe we'll get lucky and it will be on the lower side. 
maybe we'll be horribly unlucky and it will be up here. But uh, that is the nature of risk. There's no certainty in assessing future risk for this any more for than the probability that your house will burn down at the time that you uh, decide you're going to buy homeowner's insurance for it. You're not certain your house will burn down or that it won't. Uh, you have to operate under uh, uncertainty. Now we can get specific. So this is a chart of wind risk for Boston, um, where I live. This is using five plant, plant models. This is return period of hurricanes of this, these different categories of strength. So for example, a Cat 4 hurricane near Boston is extremely unlikely today. Maybe you'd see it once a thousand years, okay? Uh, again, the shading is the scatter among the models, whereas uh, by the end of the century, if we don't do anything, it will be once in a hundred years or something like that. Cat 3 would go from a hundred to a few decades, that sort of thing. Um, and we look at the, the model also produces rain, so this is return periods of rain of a given storm total on this chart. Blue is for the current climate. So you'd have to wait 10,000 years to see 150 millimeters of rain today, whereas in the future uh, it might be once a century. And if you're trying to predict flooding, uh, numbers like this are important. As I said before, we can couple these uh, tracks to hydrodynamic surge models. This is from a study we did for the city of New York about seven or eight years ago, before Sandy, I might add, uh, where we wanted to predict surge levels at the battery here, which is at the southern tip of Manhattan Island, where there happens to be a good tide gauge. And we did two different kinds of models, a public model called the slosh model, which is on a regular circular computational grid centered in northern New Jersey and a unstructured, much more sophisticated hydrodynamic model called ADSERC, whose grid points you see out here, but are also much more concentrated around the city. So we coupled you know, thousands of storm tracks to this model to predict thousands of surges. And uh, I could show you the New York results. It uh, actually predicted that Sandy, in terms of its surge, would be about a 400-year event, so we think and other groups have come to similar conclusion that Sandy was a very rare event in the current climate, but won't be so rare in the future if for no other reason than the sea level is going up. But this is uh, surge risk in Boston Harbor for the current climate in blue and for future climate in red. And then when it goes down here, you're reducing the return period, you're increasing the frequency. So what was a 10,000 year event, again, becomes more like a 1,000 year event. And what was a 1,000 year event becomes like a 100-year event. And that's assuming that the sea level doesn't go up. If you allow for increase in sea level of a meter um, by the end of the century, then you get really big differences. And so uh, the city of Boston is extremely worried about this. And they, are, uh, they take this seriously. Should they be um, trying to uh, rezone the waterfront? Should they be trying to build a storm barrier to keep the water out? What should they do? Uh, these are serious issues. And projections uh, in the U.S. Uh, are very uncertain, uh, but this is, um, this is sort of a current projection from these risk models. What's the current hurricane risk? This is power, hurricane power at landfall, which is a measure of the destructive potential of hurricanes on our coast. The green is, again, a measure of uncertainty. This is for the period 1976 to 2005. And again, in a business as usual scenario, for the end, the last 30 years of the century in blue, but with this huge range of uncertainty, which is unfortunately life in the climate modeling world. Uh, climate modeling is still an uncertain enterprise, but there's enough known to be rather relatively sure that we're running a risk. Okay, we're running a risk for this stuff. Um, a group uh, in New York under Michael Bloomberg, uh, when he was the mayor, did a a comprehensive U.S. study of projected monetary losses from hurricanes and other phenomena. I'm just showing you the hurricane part of this. Um, this is expected annual losses to the United States from hurricanes for the year 2030 in the left, 2050 in the middle, and 2100 at the right. Um, the blue is just accounting for sea level rise and assuming hurricanes themselves don't change. And the green is also accounting for sea level rise. So 
uh, by the end of the century, we could be looking at an additional uh, $70 billion a year in losses in the US, again, with a certain amount of uncertainty. Okay. So let me summarize, because I, I prefer to answer your questions. I think it's much more interesting than talking. Uh, the weight of existing evidence does support the conclusion that if we don't do anything, um, climate warning pre presents a significant risk to future generations. Uh, I don't actually have any colleagues, including people who have been advertised as scientific skeptics, who don't believe that. Uh, and we've done a lousy job communicating to the public that we're in all pretty much agreement at this point that this is a risk. A risk, okay, not a certainty. Among the many risks posed by climate change are changes in extreme events, including hurricanes. Uh, amongst those who study hurricanes, there's a pretty strong consensus that the frequency of high intensity events like Cat 5s uh, should go up. And um, on the other hand, there's not much consensus about what happens to the far more numerous weaker storms that in practice don't do that much damage. They could increase or they could actually go down with climate change. There's also a strong consensus that because uh, this is pretty straightforward physics, actually, that rainfall from hurricanes, which is one of the two really dangerous, if unsexy, aspects of their existence, is going to go up. And there's evidence that's already happening. And so freshwater flooding risk uh, will almost certainly increase. Um, the increased high category events coupled with sea level indicate a strong risk of increased surge. But let me just end by telling you what I think the <coughs> elephant in the room is here, what in this particular sphere has us worried. Get your mind around this. The global population exposed to tropical cyclones has tripled since 1970. Tripled. Now, the world population didn't triple in that period, thank God. But there is a huge migration to the coastline all around the world undergoing. For various reasons, people are moving from inland to the coast, okay? That's why there's so many empty seats in the sanatorium. They've all gone to Boston or Miami. Um, and undeniably, this is happening at a time when sea level is rising and is expected to rise at an accelerated rate. So you have a convergence of a demographic and a sea level trend. And as I've said to you, the incidence of intense tropical cyclones is expected to increase. So I would predict fairly confidently that in spite of the fact that our forecast of individual events is getting better, the incidence of tropical cyclone disasters like Haiyan, like Katrina, like Sandy, is going to rise very substantially. And it would do so even if the climate were stable. This is not purely a climate change statement. This is a demographic statement, mostly. Okay. What's driven the huge increases, I didn't show you these, of tropical cyclone damage over the last 30, 40 years is mostly the fact that people are just moving to and building in the coastlines. And actually, I didn't mean to show that. That is really the end of my talk. I will say that. Um, Part of the reason in the United States that we see this huge trend toward the coast is that coastal people have been extremely successful at getting folks like those living inland here to subsidize their insurance. And so since we're underwriting their risk taking, not surprisingly, they're taking risks. This is well known to people who study this. It's a social, political science issue, and it's a really big issue because we are setting ourselves up for a string of Katrinas and Sandys, as far as the eye can see, without climate change. And climate change will just make that worse. And that's something we can all do something about. OK? Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.